praise the Lord. Good morning, church. Welcome to Winterville Baptist Church. So glad that you're part of our time together this morning. Want to take a minute and welcome everyone in the fellowship hall as well as online. And who knows, we may have some folks sitting out in the parking lot at this point in time. I want to start this morning by just encouraging everyone to use our masks. There's masks available as you come into the building. Please utilize those. And even more than that, let me just stress one more time get the vaccine. If you can get vaccinated, that is the best thing you can do for yourself and for people around you. Uh, you know, it's frustrating to me as a pastor as well as to everybody else I know that it seems like right now we're having to take steps backwards. You know, once we thought we were coming out of the woods and we could take our masks off and get back to some type of uh, normal routine, now uh, the COVID numbers have gone crazy again. And I'm sure that you're aware of all that. So we need to do everything we can to keep one another safe. Uh, as of Friday, there were 212 new cases just Friday in Pitt County of COVID-19, just in our county, over 200. As of last night at midnight, there were 176 inpatients at Vitam Health with COVID-19. Uh, so, you know, it's not going away. We still need to be careful. Folks are being hospitalized uh, with this. And so saying all that, our present COVID policy is, you recognize when you came into the sanctuary this morning, every other pew is roped off again. We're going to do everything we can to social distance. We're using the fellowship hall once again as a satellite sanctuary. You can spread out a little bit better in the fellowship hall than you can in here. So if you're more, more comfortable going to the fellowship hall, you can go to the fellowship hall. We've got a big screen. We're live streaming the service from in here in the fellowship hall on Sunday morning. So you can be a part of that. Hand washing stations are still in place. Still use those hand washing stations as much as you can, as much as you pass by them. Please use them. Uh, the tithes and offerings, we're pausing, passing the plate again. We've got the uh, boxes back up on the wall. So please give in your tithes and offerings, but we are not passing the plate at the current time. And again, the face masks are available. We are not doing congregational singing either as of this Sunday, at least for a little while. Hopefully it's not gonna be long, uh, but again, we wanna do everything we can to look out for one another and be as safe as we can. We're still gonna have some music and some singing. It's just that we will not be doing the singing, okay? Unless you volunteer and you get with Kathy and you're standing up here to do the singing. Uh, so let that time be a time that you uh, Prayerfully go to God and connect to God in meditation as the praise team comes up and they're singing this morning. Uh, let it be a time where you just uh, reflect on where you are in your relationship with God and maybe spend that time in prayer uh, to Him. We've got a lot of things that we could pray about this morning and I'll get to that. Bible study starting back up this Wednesday night, starting a brand new study together in the book of Romans. It's going to be fantastic. We've got the journals available. If you want to pick up a copy of this journal, it is just the English Standard Version of the Bible for the whole book of Romans, but you've got a blank page out beside every page of Scripture, so you can take your notes as we go through this. This is the Bible translation that I teach and preach out of, and so it'll be word for word as far as my text as we begin to meet on Wednesday night. Wednesday night at 6.30 right in here. We are going to live stream the Romans Bible study. The live stream will start after our time of prayer together, which is going to be probably close to 7 o'clock. And so what I want to do on Wednesday nights is we're going to spend the first part of the time together sharing prayer needs, going to God in prayer together, and then whenever we finish that time of prayer, that's when we're going to go live stream. So all our folks by way of the Internet, if you'll tune in shortly before 7, just kind of wait for it. Just depends on how the Holy Spirit moves. Could be some Wednesday nights we spend the whole Wednesday night in prayer, but we're going to be receptive to the Holy Spirit in that. But we will be live streaming the Bible study. So if you can't catch it on Wednesday night, you should be able to tune in a little bit later and catch the Bible study as it's posted on the website and on the Facebook page as well. All right. We've got a big event coming up. I think it's called Chicken on a Mission, something like that. Am I remembering that correctly? I don't know. Sometimes my old age uh, kind of fails me. Uh, but I believe we've got an event coming up, Chicken on a Mission. Have you ever heard of it? Yeah, maybe. Oh, well, look at that. We've got a chicken coming in right now. Mr. Chicken, come on up here, Mr. Chicken. I'm glad you're here this morning. As long as your eyesight, you can't see too good. Mr. Chicken, come right on up here. And our Mr. Chicken's wearing a mask. Now, he's being safe. He's showing you the example that you need to have. Mr. Chicken, I got a question to ask you first of all before we talk about chicken on a mission, all right? 
I heard about this chicken and she only laid eggs in the winter. Do you know why that was? She was no spring chicken. <laughs> but I'm glad you're here this morning because it kind of rings a bell for me. It reminds me about this thing that I just mentioned in here about chicken on a mission. That's coming up real quick. In fact, the date of this event is in your bulletin. It's September the 18th. Is that right? Have I got that date right? Yeah, all right, you heard that straight from the chicken's mouth. Now, I'm not a chicken, but he is, okay? Now, Chicken on a Mission's coming up. Somebody's already asked me about this event already this morning. September the 18th, this is going to be a fundraiser for missions. This church does a lot of wonderful ministry as far as mission work. And so we want to raise a lot of money for mission work. Now, anytime this chicken raises his hand, that means that what I just said is very, very important, all right? We need some help. <laughs> we need some help with Chicken on a Mission. The date is Saturday, September the 18th. Uh, we need folks to volunteer to come out and actually help cook the chickens. <laughs> we need some folks that'll bake some desserts and provide desserts. This is a plate sale. We're gonna have a craft sale. We need people that are crafty that can make some items and donate those items. We hope to have an auction, right, chicken? We wanna have an auction, we're gonna have a store where these craft items are gonna be available for people to come in and purchase. And again, all the funds are going in support of mission work. We all raise our hands on that. Yep. Well, Mr. Chicken, I think you better run and hide because if Mr. Willard finds you, you're liable to end up on the grill. <laughs> Now, I know that's, he's a brave chicken because if he'll come into a Baptist church on a Sunday morning right. before lunch, <laughs> uh, in front of, yeah, turn, turn this way. We got a blind chicken. I don't know. What in the world? He must be old. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Chicken, one more question. I've always been puzzled by this question. Why did the chicken cross the road? He was on a mission. <laughs> oh, glory. Laughter is good medicine. Did you know that? I already told you I got a sense of humor. I'm glad God gave me one. And so uh, if you don't have one, I hope that you find one. Maybe that'll be a gift that God will give you uh, before you get out of this service this morning. But excited about Chicken on a Mission. I'm looking forward to some of that good chicken and a good time together as we raise money for missions. Now, uh, we're getting ready to go into the rest of our service. The praise team's going to come up. And they're going to share a song. Uh, we are going to sit, I hope, prayerfully. And we got a lot to pray about. I want to mention these things. I want us to have a time of prayer, and I think probably during this first song that they're going to be shared, it'll be a good time for us to have an attitude of prayer. We need to be praying about the folks in Louisiana. Right now, they got a Hurricane a Cat 4 bearing down on them, Hurricane Ida. Need to pray for those folks there and just lift them up. Need to pray about the COVID situation. Need to pray about the situation in Afghanistan. We've got brothers and sisters in Christ. We've got missionaries. We've got military. Need to pray for all those folks right there in Afghanistan and all the violence and unrest that's going on there. And also I think about Haiti uh, after this terrible earthquake that they've had. It's just been one disaster after another. And you probably know some other things, but those are some things I'm going to ask you during this first song this morning. If you just join me in an attitude of prayer right where you are, and let's lift up these needs to the Lord this morning. I'm glad you're here. Welcome.
Abraham. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to shout out a big thanks for all that took part of the Watermelon Festival uh, the past three days. Uh, all the cutters that, that come out and slice the watermelon for the community. Uh, it was uh, very hot, but we had a lot of people there, and I really appreciate those that come out and cut, those that are even come out and did double duty, triple duty to get everything cut. So it was, it was a blessing to have to be able to serve others in that way and see the, the joyous and smiles of all the fellas and especially the little children that got, that got free watermelon. So our scripture vo uh, verses today uh, is in Psalm 96, verses 1 through 4, and it goes like this. If everyone would stand for the reading of God's word. And I'm reading out of the New International Version. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. Let's pray together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you in this sanctuary, your house, to praise you and worship you and provide you the thanks and the gratitude for what you've done in our lives. You have blessed us so much and we just thank you and cannot thank you enough for that. Father, we live in a world that you created and we see a lot of things in it that, that is disturbing, that is a burden to our hearts. People suffering through hurricanes, through fires, through health conditions, pandemics that we have been through over the past year and a half to two years. But let us not forget that there's other things out there that's not well with this world. There's homelessness. There is famine. Father, all these things may be a burden and a suffrage on your people. But let us keep, always remember the good things. You have made so many things good. You have made us. You have made the flowers. You have made the seasons. You have made things that provide us joy and celebration. So don't ever let us forget all the good things, for they're there if we just like to take the time to look and notice them. Father, we are servants to you. Use us, use me to minister to those in need. Your love is unbounding and unsacrificial. We thank you for that, Father. Allow us to be attentive to the needs in our community. Give us the desire and the resources to reach out to others to help them in whatever path or whatever issue that they're having. Father, we ask that your spirit be with us today. Dwell within us. Cleanse us so we may take in your word and make us a better servant, a better Christian, a better brother, 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 sister, and a better community that we live in. We love you, Father, and we ask you to continue to bless us. Bless this congregation. We lift up Pastor Mike and his ministry to us in this community. 
continue to provide him the health and the wisdom and the strength and the conviction and passion to preach your word the way you would be pleased to be. And now, Father, we ask that everything we do in this service be pleasing to you, and may it always be an honor and glory and fruitful for your kingdom. We ask for our sins and shortcomings to be forgiven, and we repent of them, Father. And all this that we pray in our precious Son's name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
officiate the ordination of another minister or another deacon is a great honor and privilege. And I'm thankful for the way that God continues to supply every need that this church needs and every need that his church needs in general. God is always faithful. And we need folks who are willing to step up and willing to serve. And so I am so thankful that God has blessed this church uh, with faithful deacons, folks that are willing to step forward and say, I want to be used by God and I want to do what God's called me to do. And I believe that's true of Tim Woolard. He's going to be coming in just a few moments. We're going to be setting him apart. We're going to be laying hands on him. And as a church, we're going to uh, make some vows and promises that we're going to make to him. He's going to make some vows and commitments to us. And I believe that God's going to be honored through it all. And so for a few minutes this morning in Acts chapter 6, before we get to the ordination part of this time together today, I want to ask you a question. Do you know your deacon? Do you know your deacon? And from Acts chapter 6, I hope that we're going to learn from God's Word uh, what a deacon is supposed to be. What can we expect from a deacon? What can a deacon expect from us? I believe it's in Acts chapter 6 that we have a, a setting apart of uh, these individuals we're getting ready to read about, setting apart at least for the ministry that a deacon is in charge of. And so we're in Acts chapter 6. I'm going to begin to read in verse 1. I'm going to invite you to stand your feet with me in reverence to the reading of God's Word. Let's stand together as we read our text in Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. I'll read through verse 8. Acts chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Now in, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the, of the spirit and of wisdom whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Now I want to stop there this morning, but let's bow our heads together in prayer as we ask the Lord to bless the reading of his word together as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your blessed word this morning on this Lord's Day. I thank you for the wonderful time of worship we've already participated in. Thank you for the singing and the music and, uh, Lord, all the ways that you remind us uh, of open doors of opportunity you set before us. And I pray that we will be faithful to each and every one of those opportunities and even this opportunity we're given right now, this moment, to receive your word. I pray that our hearts will be open to that. I pray that you'll be honored and pleased in every word that's about to proceed from my mouth. I do not want to hinder things. I do not want to get in the way of things. God, I pray your Holy Spirit will have free reign in this time together. And because of that, I pray souls will be saved, maybe around the world, through the gift of the internet, but even right here in this house on this day. And we'll give you praise for what you're about to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. How many times have I gotten out of my car to go in a store and then remember when I get to the door, where's my mask at? you got to turn around and go get your mask, right? So I need to have that handy as we get into the rest of our service this morning. How important is leadership? In a church or in any organization or organism, that's really what a church is, how important is leadership? Well, the late Dr. Adrian Rogers used to say that no church is going to rise any higher than its leadership. And that is so true. And guess what? Somebody's got to lead and somebody's got to follow. You know, the church is not a club and we're not a, a social gathering. We're, according to scripture, we're a living organism. But God is not the author of confusion. God wants everything done decently and in order, and that's why God, in His Word, gives us a structure for how the local church ought to be structured, and who ought to be leading, and we ought to be following, and God help us to always be engaged in unity in the task that God has called us to. 
And so I'm thankful that God calls leaders in the church. Of course, your pastor is a leader that God has called in your church. And I believe also in any local body of believers, if a church is healthy, God's going to call forth people from the congregation to step forward and also serve under the shepherd that God has called to that local church to, to lead the church in the direction that we're supposed to go in. Now, deacon, a deacon in a church is a servant. In fact, that's really what the word means, deacon. It's a servant in the church. Now, our deacons also lead, but they lead through serving. I believe in any New Testament church, Christ is the head of the church. Amen? Christ is the head of the church. And then I believe that any local church ought to be ruled by the congregation. That's why we've got to have business conferences from time to time. And so you as a congregation get an opportunity to cast your vote and decide on the direction of the church. And so I believe that Christ is the head. Uh, the church ought to be congregationally ruled. But then the church needs to be pastor-led and a servant and, and deacon served. And that's God's structure according to the New Testament. That's the way a New Testament church is designed by God to function. And so this message this morning, as I speak for a few moments from Acts chapter 6, it's for our deacons, yes, but I believe it's also for every single one of us. Because when I talk about servanthood in the church, that's not just the pastor and it's not just the deacons. God's called us all to serve in His church. And I pray the Holy Spirit would light a fire under us that we would be motivated to do what God indeed is calling us to do. Now right here in Acts chapter 6, this is often referred to as the first ordination for the first deacons in the New Testament church. Now you may have noticed in that text, we really don't have these men called deacons. But the word that you see in verse 2 that says to serve tables, that word serve is translated from a Greek word, diakonos, and that's the same word, Greek word that we get our word deacon from. And so even though these men are not directly referred to as deacons right here in Acts chapter 6, what they're called to do is certainly the responsibility and a task that the deacon ought to be doing. So I believe, I don't believe it's a, it's a twist of scripture here to say this is the ordination of the first deacons in the New Testament church. And so as we look at this, I want you to note some things with me, not just about a deacon, but things that ought to be true about every single one of us. But certainly they ought to be true about leaders in the church. Now the first thing I want to say about deacons, deacons are conflict solvers. They solve conflicts. They don't create them. All right, you with me? Deacons are conflict solvers. And this is something that ought to be true about every single one of us. We ought to be about in the church solving problems and looking for ways that we can solve problems in the church that will bring honor and glory to God. Now look at verse 1 of our text. Verse 1 says, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number. Now here's a wonderful problem to have, right? The church is growing. The Lord is adding to the number of the church. Now remember how many apostles were there? There's only 12. And those are the pastors in this church. And how many members were there? Multiplied thousands. If you'll read in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost, and that is the biblical record of what we see as the birth of the New Testament church. On the day of Pentecost alone, when Peter stood up and preached the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says at least 3,000 people got saved and they were added to the church. And so there's multiplied thousands of people in this New Testament church, and you've only got 12 apostles. You've only got 12 ministers involved in this and trying to minister to all the needs that were taking place and so the church was growing and you know why the church was growing it wasn't because the 12 apostles were doing all the work listen it's not the pastor's responsibility to build the church it's not my responsibility to draw people to the church you know whose responsibility it is it's your responsibility we share this responsibility the Great Commission was not just given to the pastor. It wasn't just given to the deacons. The Great Commission was given to every single one of us as born-again believers to go into all the world and preach the gospel and baptize them in the name of the Father and the, and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're all called to that. And you know what the New Testament church did? They took seriously the call of God on their life to go out and preach the gospel and make disciples. And what's interesting here is they didn't go through a six-week training program. 
You know, Baptists now throughout the years, we've been real good at spitting out programs, you know. We got this program and we got that program. You know, it's interesting here in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, that these new believers in this new church, they didn't have a training program. They didn't go through evangelism explosion. But guess what happened? Evangelism exploded. You know why? Not just because the preachers preached, but because the people went out and they shared their faith with those in their community. Shepherds don't produce sheep. Sheep produce sheep. Do you hear me? Sheep produce sheep. And so God's called me to be an under-shepherd here in this church as He is the great shepherd, but we got to go out. we got to take seriously the call of God on our lives to be a witness to those folks we come in contact with. And so these early believers in the early church, they go out, they're, they're just foolish enough to say, okay, God, you're commanding us to go. We don't have any training, but we're going to go and do what you've called us to do in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know what the result was of that? Man, the church is just, the doors are busting open. So many people in the church getting saved by the thousands. You talk about revival. And God's just pouring out His favor on the New Testament church here in Acts chapter 6 because the church was being faithful to do what God had called the church to do. Now, anytime there's growth in a church, there's going to be problems that take place. There's going to be problems that arise in a growing church. Now, I'm thankful when I see the church growing because that's exciting. You know, and the more the church grows, we've got more to offer and we've got more folks to serve and we're going to be able to reach more people. So I believe it's God's design that the church ought to grow. But it's not the pastor's responsibility to make sure the church grows. God's the one who's going to grow His church if we'll just be faithful to do what God has called us to do. So in Acts chapter 6, you've got the church. It's just been born. You read about it in Acts chapter 2. And the church is growing, multiplied thousands of people in the church. You only got 12 ministers you got the 12 apostles and a problem arises in the church now I want you just to note what the problem was the Bible says in this New Testament church uh, there were Hellenists there were a group of Jews that were known as the Hellenists those were the Greek speaking Jews and then the Bible says there were the Hebrews these were the Hebrew speaking Jews now what was happening here in the this early church is that you had these two cultures now, you had these two cultures, and both of them were Jewish, but you had the Hebrew Jews who spoke the Hebrew language, and then you had the Greek-speaking Jews, or the Hellenists, and these were the Jewish people, for the most part, that were scattered all over the known world of their day because of the persecution that had already taken place, and so they were scattered, and they were scattered into Greek-speaking communities, and so those Jews that were living away from Israel begin to speak the language in the community that they lived in, and so they're speaking the Greek language. And what would happen on holy occasions, religious feasts like Passover, is that the Jewish people would come back to Jerusalem. And so you've got these Greek-speaking Jews coming back to Jerusalem, back to Israel, and then you've got the Hebrew-speaking Jews that live there in Israel, and you've got those two. And so the gospel is preached, and guess what? The Hebrew-speaking Jews, they get saved. And guess what else happens? The Greek-speaking Jews who have just come back into the homeland, they're getting saved. They're hearing the gospel. Now, the Hebrew-speaking Jews were like the, um, I've been in this church 100 years, and so I've got more clout than you do. That's kind of their mindset here, the Hebrew-speaking Jews. The Greek Jews, they're coming in from foreign lands again, and they're speaking the Greek language. Now, what happened in the early church in the book of Acts is the church was under great persecution. And people, wealthy people like Barnabas would come to the New Testament church and they would give financial donations. And they'd give these gifts to the church in order to minister, especially to the widows in the church. Because a widow, if a widow, you know, a widow didn't have a husband, if a widow didn't have a son, a widow didn't have a man to look out for her in biblical days, I mean, she was in trouble. She couldn't go out and get a job. Women didn't work like that to earn a wage. And if they didn't have a man, in biblical times it was true, they were in a heap of trouble. They didn't have social security. They didn't have all these social programs that we have today. And so the church would step in and meet those needs. And so you had wealthy people like Barnabas that would come to the church and they would give these great financial gifts to the church in order to minister to those in need within the church. Now we're talking about a mega church, a church of thousands of people in Acts chapter 6. And so you got a lot of needy people in this church. And what was happening was the Greek-speaking 
uh, people in the church who had gotten saved, who had just come back to Israel, they began to notice that it looked to them like the people that were in need among the Hebrew-speaking Jews, they were getting favored above the Greek-speaking Jews. Uh, the widows were getting more money. They were getting more food. And so when the apostles would uh, dish it out, it looked like to the Greek-speaking Jews that the, uh, the Hebrew-speaking Jews were getting a little bit more than they were getting. And so uh, they come to the apostles, to the ministers in the church, and they say, look, we see a problem going on here, and here's the problem. Now, it's interesting here that the ministers in the church, they come before the congregation, and they say, we've got to have a solution to this problem. We cannot leave the preaching of the Word, the teaching of the Word, the studying of the Word uh, to take care of all these matters that are arising in this mega church that we're trying to, to lead and trying to shepherd. And so they go before the church and these are problem solvers, you see. Deacons are conflict solvers. They don't come before the church and say, okay, we're going to pull out a remnant of this church and we're going to go down the road and we're going to have the first Baptist church of the Hebrew-speaking Jews and then we'll have the first Baptist church of the Greek-speaking Jews. That's, they're not about division, see. We need people in the church who will step forward and say, I want to serve, I want to lead in this church and I want to be about resolving conflicts that may arise in the church. And they do arise. And so we need to be people that are seeking resolution of those problems and not those that are stepping in and choosing sides. And I believe deacons ought to be real leaders in the church, ought to be problem solvers, not problem makers. And uh, also interesting here that the ministers in the church realize, the apostles realize, we can't do it all. And I know as a pastor, I can't do it all. And we're supposed to meet one another in the middle and, and join hands and hearts and be determined that we're going to serve the Lord in this church and anytime there's a crisis uh, we're going to do all that we can to resolve the crisis and deacons are here to serve and deacons are here to relieve a lot of the problems that would burden down a pastor that would keep a pastor from studying the word of God preparing to stand in this place and also in prayer it's interesting here that the apostles said you know once this problem is resolved they say now we can spend our time in prayer and in the study of the Word. That is the most important thing that a pastor can do. You know, in this church, I'm glad, I'm thankful that we've got a deacon family ministry. And what that means is every member in this church who's active, you have a deacon assigned to you. And those deacons have a list of families that they're supposed to minister to. And so I hope that you know who your deacon is. In fact, I would ask for a show of hands, but I'm, I'm kind of leery to do that because I'm afraid I wouldn't have many hands going up. I hope you know who your deacon is. If you do not know who your deacon is, please come to me and let me know uh, because our deacons are supposed to be letting you know I'm your deacon. And so not only do you have a pastor, but you also have a deacon that you can call on. If you've got a ministry need, you can call on them, and they're there for you to minister to you. And by the way, there's no way that me, one man, there's no way I get everything done that I need to get done every week. I mean, there's no way. I never get to a week where I feel like I have done all the visitation I need to do. I've done all the study I need to do. I've done all the responsibilities. Never a week I, that goes by that I feel like I have completely fulfilled all those responsibilities. So the deacons in the church, they're, they're called forth in Acts chapter 6 to help relieve the leaders of the church, the pastors of the church, the ministers of the church, of all these other things that would keep the minister from doing the number one thing that ought to be a priority in any New Testament church, and that's the preaching of the Word. Listen, I don't get my sermons off the Internet. It takes me hours every week in study and prayer just to be prepared to stand in this place to bring you a message from God's Word. How in the world is the pastor ever going to get a word for you from God if he doesn't spend time with God in the Word and in prayer. And the pastor is not supposed to do all the visitation. Now some of you aren't going to like that, but that's just biblical truth. If you always felt like the pastor is supposed to be all, all, do all the visitation, that is not a biblical perspective of what a pastor is called to do. In fact, I would say this, sometimes it may be a good thing if you're in the hospital and you look up and the pastor's not standing there. 
I mean, if you happen to be in the hospital and Pastor Mike walks in and I got a dark suit on and a white shirt and I'm leaning over your bed, that might be an indication the doctor just told your family he's dead, she's dead, they're gone. And so it might be a good thing if you look up and you don't see Pastor Mike, maybe you see a deacon. You know what, if that happens, what you ought to do is give, give praise to God instead of grumbling and complaining the pastor didn't even come to see me, you ought to give thanks to God. The pastor ain't here, so that must mean I'm going to live to see another day. Hallelujah. You ought to make it a point of rejoicing. I don't leave this place thinking, you mean tell me if I'm dying, Pastor Mike, you're not going to come see me? If somebody calls me and lets me know, I'll do everything I can to come see you. But don't get bit out of shape. I'm just saying the pastor is one man. And in Acts chapter 6, you got this problem that arises and the apostles say, look, we can't do it all. We can't meet all these needs. We've got a problem and we need a resolution to the problem. And so they step forward before the church and they resolve the issue. Leaders are problem solvers. Now, number two, let me tell you something else ought to be true about every single one of us, certainly pastors and deacons. Number two, deacons are completely sold out, or they should be. Deacon servants in the church are the cream that rises to the top. All right? The cream of the crop. They ought to be. They ought to be sold out. That's why when churches get to a place in the year where they're beginning to select their deacons to serve in the church, it never should be a popularity contest. I've had people over the years come to me and say stuff like this. They say, preacher, you know, my son doesn't come to church, but I just feel like if we would call him to be a deacon, he'd come to church more. That's not who we call to be deacons in the church. In fact, that's not who we give any positions to in the church. We want people that are already committed. I'm talking about being sold out to the Lord. All right, you hearing me? Folks who have already proved themselves. In fact, when the Bible talks about qualifications of a deacon, that's one of the qualifications. It needs to be those who have proven themselves faithful already. And so you don't give positions of service in the church of the living Lord to folks who aren't even coming to church in hopes that they'll come to church. You need folks who have already shown themselves faithful in the church that you call to these positions in the church. And the same is true in this position of, of deacon or servant in the church. Now... Uh, look at what's important in selecting these men. It's not a popularity contest. First of all, it says it talks about their character. Character matters to God. Character matters to God. You don't call somebody to serve in the church, whether it's a deacon or any other position of service in the church. You don't call somebody uh, that's as crooked as a dog's hind leg. You ever heard that expression? You don't call somebody that's dishonest. You want to call somebody a good reputation, right? You want to call somebody who's living a life above reproach. Somebody who's living a life in such a way it's not giving anybody any reason to point a finger of blame or shame at them. Uh, they're just living above reproach. Look at what the Bible says in verse 3. Verse 3 it says, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute. That means people of good reputation. Uh, folks that are out in the community living the way they ought to be living. You know what does a lot of damage to churches today? It's when churches have called people into positions of leadership in the church and they've not proven themselves to be faithful. They're not even trying to live a righteous life because you know what happens? Lost people will come to the church, people from the community, and they'll visit and they'll sit where you are and they'll look up and they'll see so-and-so up there, and they'll sit there and think, you know, well, I live right beside that guy, and I know, I know how wicked he is. I know how evil he is. Well, he's the biggest hypocrite around here. What in the world is he doing up there? I got more religion than he's got, and yet he's up there like he owns the place. You hearing me? Well, he's the biggest hypocrite around here. Now, the best place for hypocrites right here. Right here under the teaching and the preaching of God's Word. Because if that hypocrite's under the preaching and teaching of God's Word long enough, the Holy Spirit's going to get a hold of that heart, and the Holy Spirit's going to tr transform that person, not to be a hypocrite, but be part of the real deal. You hear me? So hypocrites ought to be in church. Every single person ought to be in the church. But look at how character matters to God. These are spiritual men that are called, the Bible says, men full of the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit of God. 
full of the Holy Spirit of God. You say, Pastor Mike, how am I going to know if I'm full of the Spirit of God? Is that going to mean I'm just going to just suddenly start levitating around the room? I'm just going to start floating through here? I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. No, the Holy, being filled with the Holy Spirit of God means that you're going to show forth the fruit of the Spirit. Joy and love and patience and all those things that Paul talks about in the book of Galatians. That's how you know you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. To be filled with the Spirit of God means you need to empty yourself out of you, get you out of the way, make sure that you're on the cross and He's on the throne and make sure that God's got control. That's really what being filled with the Holy Spirit means, to be in control by the Holy Spirit of God. And so when this crisis arose in the church and the preachers went before the congregation and said, okay, we need to have a resolution here. We need to choose out these men that are going to be able to serve full of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says they're to be full of wisdom. That means they think straight. They love the Lord. They've proven themselves already. They love the Word of God. Look at verse 4. And the ministers say, We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. We've got to have time to study, prepare, preach. You know what my week looks like? Pretty much one week looks like the last week. And the week before that, and the week before that. And what I'm talking about is all the hours, again, I've got to spend in the study of God's Word. I mean, that takes discipline. That's why a lot of pastors and a lot of ministers get burnt out and they leave the ministry uh, because it's just, here we go again. You know what the, the number one day of the week that's most depressing to a pastor? It's probably the most depressing day for you. I don't know, maybe it's Sunday for you. I hope not. But it's Monday. Monday is the most depressing day. It's Monday. That's the one day of the week that the pastors who write out letters of resignation, that's the day of the week that it happens, or it happens on Monday. You know why? Because all the hours we've just poured in in the ministry to get ready to preach and teach, now we get to Monday, we start all over again. We've got a blank sheet of paper. Now it's start all over again. You know, it takes me about, on average, probably 15 hours of study just to prepare one sermon. And then it's hours of study just to, to, to prepare and to plan to, to teach the Bible, Bible on Wednesday night. And so I'm just saying, it don't just come just like that. Just because God's called me to minister and called me to preach, you know, the Bible says, study to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. I don't want to be ashamed. I want to make sure I'm, I'm fully prepared for what God has called me to do. Look at verse 5. This is a miracle right here in any Baptist church because verse 5 says, and what they said pleased the whole gathering. Everybody's happy. Now that's a miracle right there because, I mean, I can't make everybody happy. I've been pastoring churches now for 30 years. There's no way I'm going to make everybody happy. And you know what else I found out? I can't make anybody do anything. I mean, I can't even make my dog roll over. You think I'm going to make you live right? I mean, you, that's why I'm not standing up here saying you got to do this and you got to do that. Because, listen, I know you got a brain of your own. All I can do is I can recommend. You know, you ought to do this and you ought to do the other thing. And you need to be careful and you need to get vaccinated and you need to wear a mask. But I'm not coming down there putting a mask on your face. you got to make up your own mind. It's just like serving the Lord. I mean, you got to make up your own mind. I'm going to be committed. I'm going to walk in righteousness. I'm going to be the man or the woman that God's called me to be. God, help me do this that I'm going to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and so you got to make that decision you got a responsibility but man the Bible says that this just pleased the whole gathering and we're talking about a mega church here now I want you to look at the names of these that were chosen and called out to be deacons now it's interesting here that every one of these names are Greek names now the conflict remember what the conflict was in this church the Greek-speaking Jews rose up and they said, we got a, a beef here, we got a conflict here, we feel like we're being neglected, the Greek-speaking Jews, or the one who brought the complaint to the preachers. And so when the church chose these to come out to resolve the problem, these are all from the Greek-speaking Jews. I just thought that was interesting. Now let me tell you what these names mean because this is important. The first one we've got mentioned here is Stephen. The name Stephen means crown, crown. We need folks serving in the church who have their eye on a crown. Not an earthly crown, but a heavenly crown. 
We know our reward is going to be in heaven. And so Stephen reminds us that, even his name. We've got the name Philip. Philip is a name that means warrior. We need those serving in the church who know there's a spiritual battle that's raging. This battle is real. And we've got to put on the full armor of God. We've got this man by the name of Pro Prochorus. That name actually means leading in a course. That reminds me I am not a, I'm not up here doing a solo job, all right? I'm part of a group. Those that serve in the church, we're part of a group. We need to serve the Lord like a chorus, like a choir, hand in hand, serving the Lord in unity, functioning under the unction of the Holy Spirit. God give us some gumption, amen? In the church to serve in the way that God's called us. We've got Nicanor. That's the fourth one mentioned here in this list. His name means victorious. We don't need people serving in the church who have a victim mentality. We're victors. We're more than conquerors through Christ. We've got Timon mentioned. That's kind of, uh, you know, we're ordaining a Tim this morning, right? We've got our own Timon right here, Timon Woolard. You know, we're going to ordain him in just a minute. But the fifth one we've got right here, set apart by the New Testament church, his name was Timon. His name means honorable, deemed worthy. We need those serving in the church who see serving in the church as worthy. It's a worthy calling. It's an honor, it's a privilege for me to be used by God. And then we've got Parmenas. His name means faithful. We need some faithful folks in the church. We need some folks that we don't have to run after week after week after week. Where you weren't here for two weeks, where were you? You know what I mean? We need folks that are faithful. Folks that love the church, love the word of God. The seventh one mentioned here is a man by the name of Nicholas. His name means conqueror conqueror we need folks that are courageous against sin in a wicked world and know that we're victors and we're conquerors against the enemy as he comes against us so uh, these that are called forth in this early new testament church they are individuals who are or crisis solvers they're problem solvers they're completely sold out and number three third thing i want you to note right here deacons are continuing servants continuing servants now, these seven deacons, uh, I believe, that are, are called here, set apart by the church, ordained by the church. The Bible says they did the laying on of hands, and, and I'm going to lay hands on Tim in just a few minutes, and we're going to pray for him as a church. We're not going to be able to do what we normally would do as far as us all gathering around him, him because of COVID. We're going to have to be careful this morning, but I'm going to encourage you to join me in a time of prayer for him when Tim comes up and we kneel at this altar, and I lay hands on him and we pray for him. Uh, but those serving in the church, we need some faithfulness in the church. And what I mean by that is we need some folks that are already shown themselves to be faithful in attendance, faithful in their giving, faithful in their serving. Uh, you know, what kind of, if you're married, what kind of marriage would you have, dear sir, if you never went home to your wife? What kind of marriage would you have? Now, we got a lot of folks that are members of this church that I'm yet, yet to meet. You can say because of COVID or whatever, I don't know, but you know. Somebody asked me the other day, how many members you got in your church? You know, I really don't know, but I think it's like 300, 300 some people, but uh, they're actually official members of this church on the roster. That's including active and inactive. I think it's somewhere in that ballpark. But yet we don't, you know, I probably never will meet some of those folks that are members of this church. And so when I talk about deacons or continuing servants, I'm talking about being faithful to the church. And so they're here. And I know in COVID we've got to be careful again, but you need to be plugged in. If you've got to do it online or you've got to do it in the parking lot or you've got to do it in the fellowship hall, if you're not comfortable coming here face to face, you need to be plugged in to the ministry that you're a member of that God's called you to. And you need to be faithful in your participation. You need to be faithful in your attendance. You need to be faithful in your serving. You need to be faithful to the ministry God's called you to. And all seven of these that were called here in this early church in Acts chapter 6, they were faithful, they were continuing servants. It's interesting, you know, if you follow this on through, you've got at least two of these that are mentioned a little bit later, and they go out, and Stephen's one of them. Remember Stephen is stoned to death? But Stephen goes out into the community, and uh, he's a bold witness. I mean, he would not back down. He stood strong. And when the religious people came against Stephen and they stoned him because of the gospel message, remember what he said as he was dying? He looked up to heaven. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You know, that's the kind of servants we need in the church. 
Lord God, forgive them. And you know where he got that from? From our Lord Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross. That's the exact same thing that Jesus said. You know what Stephen was doing? Following in the footsteps of Jesus. He was emulating him. He was being Christ-like. God help us all be Christ-like. Stephen, that's what would happen with Stephen. He's one of these seven. And then we've got another man by the name of Philip. You also see a glimpse of him a little bit later. He goes out of the book of Acts. He's preaching this great big crusade. I mean, people are coming out of the woodwork. They're coming everywhere to hear Philip preach. And then the Holy Spirit speaks to Philip and says, Philip, I want you to leave the big crusade and I want you to go out in the wilderness, out in the desert. And when he did, remember it's recorded in the book of Acts, he met this Ethiopian eunuch who's sitting in his chariot and God calls Philip to go and minister to that Ethiopian eunuch. And that eunuch gets saved, accepts Christ, and is baptized. And Philip does that. And so these were those that were called by the church, those that were faithful to the church, and those that were already serving in the gospel ministry that God had called them to. And so, you know, a leader in the church, a leader in the church ought to be those that are serving, those that are already attending, those that are worshiping, those that are continuing in the ministry, what we do as a church is important. What we do as a church is important. What we do as a ministry here known as Winterville Baptist Church, what we're doing here are, is going to last forever. I mean, we're sowing eternal seeds in the gospel kingdom even as we go live stream and online. You know, this is the, this is the time on the Lord's Day I reach the most people than I reach any other time during the week as a preacher of the gospel and as a minister. And if I'm not equipped, if I'm not ready to do what I'm doing on this Lord's Day, then I'm failing in the calling that God's placed upon me. And so what's the remedy? God's called other people to step up and to serve, to lighten the load of the ministers that God calls to be under shepherds in the church and so they can focus on the main thing. And so as I talk about deacons this morning, I talk about servants in the church. We ought to be conflict solvers. We ought to be completely sold out. And we ought to be people that are faithful, that continue in the service that God's called us to regardless regardless of what happens around us. Now, I'm going to stop right there with the message, but I want us to bow together in prayer. We're getting ready to stand. I'm going to give an invitation, and then we're going to go right into our time of ordination. But right now, let's bow together, and let me pray for you as we ask God to close this service in whatever way He, see, he sees fit. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Your Word is, is so true. Life-changing, soul-saving, I thank you for the way that you have structured your church, Lord, and, and the way that it ought to operate. Lord, you are the head of this church. It's all about you. It's about what, what you want, Lord, for this church. And then, Lord, you've called me here to lead, and, and Lord, somebody's got to lead. We don't want to be a mob with many heads and no brains. God, you, you're, you're a God not of confusion but of order. I thank you for calling me in the ministry, Lord, and I thank you for calling me here to this church to, uh, to be the leader you have placed in this, uh, over this body of believers, Lord, to lead. I thank you for those that you ri raise up in this church, Lord, to lead alongside of me. Lord, to help me as a minister of the gospel. I thank you for our servants. I thank you for our deacons. I, I thank you, Lord, for every single man and woman, young person, Lord, in this church who, who steps out and say, says, I want to be part of what God is doing here at Winterville Baptist Church. Help us to be faithful to you. Lord, help us to be the type of servants that you would be pleased with. Lord, that put a smile on your face. And I'm praying right now as we come to the close of this message, Lord, and and uh, we get ready to enter into this ordination of Brother Tim as he, he comes on as a deacon. I, I pray if there's anybody that needs to respond, maybe somebody in the fellowship hall, I pray they're making their way over here right now if they need to come. Maybe folks by way of the internet, I pray that you would hear their prayers as they cry out to you. Maybe somebody's getting saved on this Lord's Day. Maybe somebody's rededicating their life. Maybe somebody's surrendering to a call upon their life, Lord, right now. I just pray you close this service, Lord, in whatever way you see fit. Again, I pray you'd be honored and glorified in all that's about to take place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, I'm going to ask you to reverently stand to your feet with me if you would. I want to give just a time of invitation. Just have an attitude of prayer right now if you would. Every head bowed. 
Uh, we're not going to sing a song as an invitation, but I want to give a time of invitation. I believe every time the gospel is preached, there ought to be a time that you have to respond. If you need to come forward right now, you can step, step up. You can come forward. Right now as Kathy plays, maybe somebody here, you need to rededicate your life. You need to come right now. Maybe you want to come to this altar. You're welcome to do that right here, right now. Maybe it's something between you and God. You say, you know, preacher, I don't even think I need to speak to you about it. It's just something I need to get right with God. You can do it right where you are. Open your heart right now. Ask God to forgive you. Maybe you've not been a faithful servant in this church. Maybe if, if you're honest, you'd say, you know, I've not really been a, a peacekeeper. I've been more of a troublemaker. Lord God, forgive me. Does anybody need to come? Maybe God's spoken to your heart. You know you need to come be a part, be a member here at Winterville Baptist Church. You can come right now. Baptism, if you seek that, you come right now. Does anybody need to respond? Just a moment more. Anybody need to respond? Anybody need to respond? It's not too late. You can come right now. church I'm going to invite you to be seated as we prepare to enter into our time of ordination of our new deacon let this song minister to you as you have a prayerful attitude pray for Tim as he's coming as he's going to be ordained and pray for all our deacons and servants in this church
Deacons. Has Tim made his way down? Where's Tim Willard at? Come on up, Lonnie, if you would, as we start our ordination. Tim, come up here and join me on this front row, if you would. As Lonnie Stafford, uh, one of your current deacons, just a FYI for some of you that may not know, uh, we have nine deacons that serve each year. Three of them rotate off each year. So it's a three-year uh, service period. Uh, and from your votes uh, this year, the, the new deacons are and if they would stand, Willard Joyner, Tony Cook, he's there in the back, takes care of all the audiovisual stuff. And the new deacon that we're going to ordain today, Tim Willard, please stand. Okay, we do also want to recognize uh, the three outgoing deacons that's rotating off this year. They are Ray Carnegie. If you would come up, please, Ray. We have Stephen Thompson also. Then we have uh, Frank Evans, which was unable to be here this morning. We want to thank you, and I personally want to thank each one of you that's rotating off, Steve and and Ray, and especially Frank, for their service and commitment over the past three years. Yeah. And I would recommend if each one of y'all take a time just after the service or sometime soon to acknowledge them and thank them for their uh, faithful service to this congregation. Also, the, yeah. the other deacons present here, uh, Janet Rollins, if you please come up front. Bernie Pittman, then also Jerry Powers. And Lonnie Stafford. I want to ask these men to just remain standing up here through the duration of the ordination service, which uh, will not be long this morning, but uh, is going to be special. I want to go to God in prayer together. Let's, let's pray right now. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for reminding us this morning from your word in Acts chapter 6 uh, what a servant should be in a church. And Lord, I thank you for the way that you provided for the ministry here that belongs to you. And Lord, you know our hearts. We want to be faithful servants. We want to minister in a way, Lord, that puts a smile on your face, Lord, and joy in your heart, in a way that you can use, Lord, to build up your kingdom. So, Lord, as I pray for these who are already serving, I thank you for those who have rotated off. I thank you, Lord, for uh, the number that changes from year to year, Lord, and just the way that you provide. I, I pray for faith that we need, courage that we need, boldness that we need, Lord, to be all that you called us to be. And I pray that this church right here on this corner our light, Lord, would shine even brighter than ever before. That, Lord, you'd help us to be faithful in these last days as we serve you together. I pray your blessing upon, Lord, every household represented as these folks are standing before this congregation and before you. I pray, Lord, for this coming church year that we would be ever so diligent, Lord, to, uh, to minister in the way that you called us to, to be faithful to you in all things. I thank you for what you've done and for what you're going to do. And Lord, I thank you for these faithful servants that you've called here at Winterville Baptist Church. And I pray your blessing upon them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Again, I'm going to ask our deacons just to remain where they are, if they would. I've got a very short passage. I promise I'm not preaching another sermon this morning. But uh, listen to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. It says, Deacons likewise must be dignified not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience 
and let them also be tested first. See, that's what I was talking about from Acts chapter 6. Let them be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. And that word blameless there doesn't mean perfect. We know none of us are perfect. That word blameless means that I live my life in such a way above reproach. I want to be righteous. I want to be holy in the power that God gives me as a born-again believer. Lonnie, I'm going to ask you if you would to stand right over here in front of this table. Tim, I'm going to ask you to stand up here with me if you would. Tim Willard comes this morning as you as a congregation has, have called him to serve as a deacon. Now, Tim has never been a deacon before, and that's why we're doing an ordination service this morning. You know, usually they say once a deacon, always a deacon. You either are an active deacon or you're technically an inactive deacon, which I don't think any deacon's ever really inactive. But officially speaking, uh, that's the case. But Tim comes stepping into a brand new area of ministry that he's never served before in, and that's to serve as a deacon here in this church. And you as a congregation has, have called Tim into this position. Now, Tim, I've got some charges for you this morning. I'm going to ask you a few things, and, and uh, I'm here to remind you, so I'll tell you how you ought to respond, okay? As long as you're in agreement with that, I want you to respond likewise. But Tim, you're being called today to serve this congregation as a deacon servant. And I've got some questions I want to ask you. If you're in agreement, answer, I will. You've been called out to serve this congregation as a deacon. The title means servant. Are you ready to minister to the physical and spiritual needs of this church body? If so, please answer, I am. Will you present yourself as necessary to comfort and to counsel those in need? If so, please answer, I will. I will. <clears throat> Tim, will you seek to maintain harmony in this body and to be on the lookout for areas of conflict? If so, answer, I will. I will. Will you support your pastor and assist me as you're called upon? Will you strive to be an example, both in personal integrity and in Christian witness to your family as well as to this congregation? If so, answer, I will. I've got a charge to the church as well because it's not just about me and it's not just about Tim and it's not just about these deacons. It's also about you. So I'm going to ask you to rise to your feet. This is a charge to you. So church, congregation, I want you to listen to what I'm getting ready to ask you. To Winterville Baptist Church, you have selected these and we're in agreement that these have been called to serve as deacons here at Winterville Baptist Church. To you, as I ask you these questions as a congregation, if so, please answer, we will. Will you pray for these deacons and their families, asking God to protect them and to care for them, both physically and spiritually? If so, please answer, we will. We will. will you submit to their servanthood leadership, knowing that they have been called to be servant leaders? If so, please answer, we will. Will you seek them for counsel when the need arises and prayerfully consider their input and suggestions? If so, please answer, we will. We will. will you encourage them and their families knowing that the ministry to which they're called will bring trying times and tough situations? If so, please answer, we will. We will. Tim, I'm going to ask you if you would kneel right at this altar. I'm going to lay hands on Tim. Church, I'm going to ask you to remain standing if you would. And just in a prayerful attitude, I'm not going to invite the deacons to come up and gather around Tim because of COVID, but I am going to lay hands on him. And I'm going to invite his immediate family. If they would like to come up, they may participate in this part of the service with me if they would like to do that right now. But I want you to join me in prayer as I lead us as we lay hands on Tim in agreement with the text that we just read in Acts chapter 6. And laying hands on Brother Tim, we're just saying, you know, we support this ministry that God's called him to. And Tim, I hope you know the rest of these deacons over here, even though they're not gathered around you this morning laying hands on you, they support you and they love you and they're here to serve alongside of you and to minister with you in this calling that God's placed on your life. So in a prayerful attitude right where you are, would you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come together this morning on this Lord's Day and, and what a glorious time of worship we've enjoyed. Thank you for your word you've already spoken. But right now, Lord, we come as a church in faith and we gather around our brother Tim. I thank you for Tim. I thank you, Lord, for his service to me and my family already, Lord. I think about how he was so faithful. 
when Melissa and I back a few months ago had COVID and, and uh, we were shut up in the house for so long, I mean, Tim just went over and above and beyond. I thank you, Lord, for that spirit of servanthood in my brother. I thank you, Lord, for the way that he's, he's always there, Lord, asking me, you know, how can I help? How can I minister? How can I be a blessing to you and, and to Melissa and to the calling you've placed, Lord, God's placed on you for this church? And so, Lord, I thank you for that attitude I already see in him. And, and, Lord, this is a glorious day as I see him come forward, called by this church, I believe set apart by you to be a servant in this church. I know you've already given him all that he needs. He doesn't have to be fearful that he's going to fail. Lord, all he's got to do is just be so in love with you and so committed that he's going to be everything you want him to be. I pray you'd fill him with your Holy Spirit, Lord, to overflow it. Give him wisdom. Give him understanding. Give him discernment. Lord, help him as he continues to grow in his faith, Lord, just to be more useful, Lord, in your hands and in the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for blessing this church with Tim and his family. I thank you for the heart of a true servant. And I believe Tim shows forth that heart. And so I'm excited about these next three years to be able to serve alongside with Tim here in this church. And Lord, as well as the rest of our deacons, I pray you bless this body. Help us to have a servant attitude, to know, Lord, it's not about us, Lord, it's about you, and to follow you with our whole heart. So give Tim all that he needs, the love that he needs, the discernment that he needs, knowledge that he needs, Lord, the patience he's going to need. Lord, the times he's just going to have to uh, bite his tongue and, and rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to uh, help him deal with difficult people sometimes and, and even difficult situations in the church that arise. We're totally dependent upon you, your Holy Spirit, Lord, to have the lead, control our hearts, our minds. I pray exciting things are going to happen here in this church, right here in the heart of Winterville, that, Lord, we'll see souls saved, your church revived, that you'd use me, you'd use Tim. Lord, use every servant you've called. Lord, use us for your glory. Thank you for setting apart Tim. I thank you for this day and this ordination time. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Tim, I want to congratulate you and welcome you, brother. I love you in the Lord already. So thankful for you. Yep. I have a certificate of ordination. I want to present you, Tim, on behalf of Winterville Baptist Church to help you remember this occasion and how sacred it is. And again, I look forward to serving with you. Thanks, sir. Welcome, brother. God bless you. Give the Lord a praise often. God's good. Yep. Let our deacons know how much you love them, how much you support them, and how much you pray for them, and how thankful you are that God has called these to serve in this church. We're going to bow together in prayer. I'm going to ask our chicken man, Willard himself, to dismiss us in prayer. Would you, Willard? <laughs>